Section 11 of Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village by Tickner Edwards, read by Peter Yearsley. May, Part 2 3. Whitsuntide has fallen early this year, and that seems to me always the fittest thing. It should come, as it has come now, at the full fair tide of the spring, when the apple blossom, last ebullition of the year's youth, is at the zenith of its glory, and summer is still only a promise yet to be fulfilled. Whit Sunday in Windlecombe, to all average folk at least, excels in importance every other day in the year, Christmas Day alone excepted. There is neither man, woman, nor child in the parish with the ability to get to church, but arrives there somehow and some time during the day. For the old vicar, from his early communion service to the time he gives the benediction at close of evensong, it is a day of ceaseless action and exaltation. Every Whit Sunday, when, in fulfilment of an ancient compact between us, I go to the vicarage to share the last light of day with him alone, I find him sitting in the little summer-house at the foot of the garden, radiantly happy, yet tired as a navigator and hoarse as a crow. What befalls the curate at the end of this arduous day no one knows, for he is never visible after the final service. But Miss Sweet is said to pervade the neighbourhood of his lodging like an unquiet ghost far into the twilight, waylaying his housekeeper with offers of night socks and eau de cologne. On this fine wit Sunday morning I got to my corner in the grey old church earlier than my wont, before, indeed, the bell began its measured tolling. The schoolchildren were in their places in the south aisle, a whispering, nudging crew. The curate flitted about the chancel in his long black cassock like a bat disturbed from its dreams. The little organist sat at her harmonium. No one else, as yet, had come to church. It was good to sit thus in the cool and quiet before the service began, letting the heart go back over all the other Whitsuntides I had spent in Windlecombe, and letting the eye rove here and there through the hollow, sun-barred twilight of the old place, comparing the garlands that beautified it now with those that in former years had registered the attained prosperity of the season. For, though wherever you looked, from the window ledges of the sanctuary to the multi-centred arch of the west door, there were flowers and greenery in profusion, no garden blossom shone among them. They were all wild flowers. Every child, most of the women, and many of the men, who could spare an hour from work the day before, had been busy in the woods and fields to make this house beautiful. The old vicar's ambition was known to all, that in the church to-day every wild maytide blossom should have its place. I looked hither and thither, but could think of none that was missing. The altar was golden with cowslips, primroses, buttercups, every flower that bore the colour of gold. Bluebells hid the old oak carving of the pulpit, and with them others that were blue or purple, violet and veronica, forget-me-not and pimpernel. On all the window-ledges, not to vie with the richness of the painted glass, white flowers alone were assembled, chervil and elder, daisies that are snow-white in the mass, sprays of silver stitchwort, wreaths of hawthorn entwining all. The chancel screen was hung with festoons of pink herb robert and dead nettle, and the steps beneath it flanked with those wild growths that bear greenish flowers as well as green leaves, the wood spurge, and the paler green of arum and bryony. No colour was crowded unthinkingly upon another, each blossom held by its kinfolk of a like complexion, and a hundred forms and shades of verdure underflowed them all. Gladly I marked that there were no roses anywhere, 
and this it was that gave the day its special meaning. Last year I remembered how the wild dog-roses lauded it over everything, making Whitson a summer feast, which it never should be. But this year we are weeks in front of the roses, and the May is scarce half-blown. Now the bell commenced its slow rhythmic chime, and in the south porch, where the surplices hung, the choir-boys began to assemble. The west door stood open, and, mingling with the songs of the birds and the joyous note of the wind in the trees, footsteps sounded on the churchyard path. At first they came singly, then in twos and threes. After a while their shuffling note became continuous, and the church began to fill on all sides. I could no longer look about me, but must sit straight in my pew, contenting myself with rare side-glances. I heard the stump of old Tom Clemmer's crutches afar off in the street, heard it grow gradually louder and nearer, until it ceased on the floor of the pew behind me, and Clemmer set himself to subdue the hurricane of his breath. Mrs. Runridge fluttered up the aisle, with the tall old ferryman so close behind her, and his head so decorously lowered, that he seemed to be regaling himself with the smell of the roses in her new bonnet as they went. Farmer Coles and his retinue arrived, blocking the aisle for a full minute, until hot and flurried Mrs. Coles, by much pointing and nudging, and a hubbub of whispered directions, had succeeded in packing all her family into the two great pews. With astonishing suddenness, the erstwhile empty church had become a crowded building. All Windlecombe was there, every woman or girl in her new Whitsuntide bonnet and gay new cotton frock. And now the bell stopped. A few late stragglers came hurrying up the path, and into the rustling silence of the church, with but half-restrained momentum, a sonorous Amen came from the south porch. The little harmonium uplifted its voice afar off in the chancel. The white-robed choristers began to pour up the nave, singing as they went. The curate followed, and last of all the old vicar, as upright as any, with his sure, unfaltering stride. No stranger, seeing him keep the true centre of the way, and pass unhesitatingly to his desk in the chancel, would have dreamed that he walked in almost utter darkness, nor when he faced about and began the service with that deep-toned, serene voice of his, did any one of us believe it, though we had known him all our lives. Not a word halted, not a word went awry. Only when the time for the Bible lessons came did he give place to his helper, and even at these times we were not always delivered over to the sad-voiced, diffident curate. How much of the Bible he knew by heart, not even he himself could say, but often he would come down to the lectern, and, with a face of inspiration turned upon us, recite the whole lesson as though he who wrote it ages back stood whispering at his side. Many a time, as he ceased and turned back to his chancel seat with unerring step, and every man fetched his breath in the silence, I have marvelled at the force of habit that, when all hearts were inwardly exclaiming, could hold us mute of voice. The same thought came to me when, a little later, he stood in the pulpit, his deep tones rumbling in the rafters over our heads, and most of all it pressed itself upon me when, at close of the long service, I beheld him afar off, in the radiant flower-garden of the sanctuary, a towering white figure, with arm uplifted, nebulous, uncertain, in the multitudinous lights. But with the thought came always a kind of fear, a sensation that we were all living recklessly outside our defences, going our ways like children sheltered, aided, and irresponsible. What would happen to Windlecombe, and to us all, when the strong arm failed, and the voice no longer guided? 
At these times my comfort was always in a word of Susan Angel's, spoken with a cheery, quiet conviction from behind her rows of sweet-stuff bottles and knick-knack trays, with her young, almost girlish eyes shining out of her crabbed, ancient face. She pointed a knitting-needle at me for emphasis. "'Depend on it, my dear,' said she. "'It won't go too far when the call comes. "'Him as has christened and married, "'I and buried well-nigh all i' the place, "'and been more than a father to us. "'What would I be doing alone up there in the skies? "'No, nah, no, nah, man or spirit, it belongs to Windlecombe. "'Here is treasure be, and here I'll bide.' Four. I heard a weird tom-tomming somewhere in the village to-day, and going forth soon tracked the sound down to Cobbler Bleak's garden that lay at the far end of the green. The old man was ringing his bees. Through a gap in the hawthorn hedge I could see him standing under his apple-trees, surrounded by the hives, and beating on a saucepan with a door-key while the air above was alive with flashing wings, and resonant with the high, shrill music of the swarm. This was the first swarm of the season, although it was well on in May. Most of the Windlecombe folk kept a few hives in some odd nook or other of the garden, and these were nearly all of the ancient straw pattern. He who could get the earliest swarm was accounted at once the luckiest and most astute of bee-men, and the old cobbler's face glowed with pride through its encircling fringe of ragged white hair and whisker, as he pounded away with his key, never doubting for a moment that the noise would soon induce the swarm to settle. But the bees were in no hurry to end this one mad frolic of their laborious lives. They rose higher and higher into the blue air and sunshine, drifting to all parts of the compass in turn. They veered out far over the roadway, swept back towards the cottage, hovering a while like a grey cloud over the chimney-tops, took an indecisive turn round the next garden, reappeared in their old station above the orchard, as little inclined as ever, apparently, to make a permanent halt, and all the time their high tremulous music burdened the air, Every dog in the village barked, and every goose quacked its sympathy, and the old cobbler beat steadily on his pan. I got my elbows comfortably into the gap in the hedgerow, the better to enjoy the scene. The garden was completely surrounded by the hawthorn hedge, a glowing wreath of white, against which shone masses of blooming lilac and laburnum and red garden may. The little cottage at the back of the shop stood up to its window-sills in bright colour, every old-fashioned flower crowding about it. The winding red-tiled paths ran between borders of the same rich living hues, and beyond in the orchard, splashed over with blue-grey shadows and quivering gold, as the sunshine flittered through the leaves, were innumerable hives, old-fashioned skeps of straw, each with its little chanting company of bees. The old cobbler spied me in the hedgerow gap, and beckoned me to join him. He was without hat or coat, and wore his leather apron. A half-mended boot, thrown down on the path, showed how hastily he had been summoned from work. As I came up, he managed somehow to extract from the saucepan an exultant, almost jeering tune. "'Ah!' cried he, blinking up at his whirligig property. "'Can you show the like of that un? You as keeps bees in patent machines. Now unlike straw there be, as I allus telled you, these year newfangled boxes. You'll a narrow swarm this side of Corp Christian. I lay a pot of six. It wanted still four or five days to the date of the great Roman festival of Corpus Christi in Stavisham, which annually drew all village sightseers from far and near. I reflected sadly and rather shamefacedly, that not only was a swarm from my modern roomy frame-hives little to be expected during that interval, but that it was the last thing I had hitherto desired. Working at home, among my trim, up-to-date hives, 
with all the latest scientific methods in apiculture at my fingertips. It seemed a fine thing to possess bees that had almost forgotten how to swarm, and that could bring me in a double or treble harvest of honey. But here, in the beautiful old bee garden, I began dimly to perceive another side to the argument. Whether courage or ignorance had led him to resist the tide of progress in beekeeping that has all but engulfed this gentlest, most picturesque of village crafts, the old cobbler might be right after all. My honey was better and more abundant than his, but it might well be dear at the price. The swarm was coming lower now, and the wildly flying bees closing their ranks. Above our heads the air grew dark with them. It was plain that they would soon be settling. Of a sudden the clanging key music ceased. Bleak pointed triumphantly to a bough in a tree hard by. A little knot of bees had fastened there, no bigger than a clenched fist. But as I looked it doubled its size with every moment. From all the regions of sunny air above us the bees thronged towards the cluster. In a short five minutes hardly one remained on the wing, and in place of the wild trek song a dull, uncanny silence held the air. From the drooping apple-bough the whole multitude hung together in a dark brown mass, looking strangely like a huge cigar, as it swayed idly to and fro in the gentle breeze. And now the old cobbler went about the work of hiving the swarm in the old way, punctiliously observing all the traditional rites of the craft. A jar of ale was brought out, from which we must both drink, to sweeten our breath for the coming ceremony. Then, having washed his hands, Bleak set about the dressing of the hive. It was a new skep, one of many he had himself made during the long winter evenings bygone. He gathered first a handful of mint and balm and lavender, and with this he carefully scrubbed out the skep. Then he made a syrup of brown sugar and beer, wherein he gave the hive a second thorough dressing. Finally, having cut two or three leafy boughs of elder, he took the skep with its baseboard under his arm, and approached the swarm on tiptoe and with bated breath. The bees hung in the sunshine, as silent, as inert as ever, except that a dozen or so were hovering about the cluster, humming a drowsy song. The note contrasted oddly with the wild, merry music of the flying swarm, when all had seemed mad with excitement, as though they were setting forth on some fierce neck-or-nothing adventure, instead of the rather tame business in which they were at present absorbed. The old bee-man stepped warily towards them, and holding the skep mouth upwards beneath the cluster, gave the branch a vigorous shake. Like so many black currants, the entire mass of bees rattled down into the hive when the baseboard was swiftly clapped over them, and the hole inverted and placed upon the ground. Waiting a minute or two, the old man then gently raised one edge of the skep, and propped it up with a stone. A few hundred bees came tumbling out, with a sound like the boiling over of a cauldron, but the greater part of the swarm remained within the hive. Before half an hour had passed, they had completely accepted the situation, and the worker bees were lancing busily off in all directions, in search of provender for the new home. The old cobbler's prediction that I should have no swarm by Corpus Christi fell true enough. Every day I watched, until the hours for swarming had passed by eventlessly, and then, on the great Stavisham feast-day, in the sunny calm of afternoon, I followed the straggling line of sightseers by the riverway to the town. 5. A hush is over the little precipitous market town. The hot May sun beats down on the waiting lines of people, on the fragrant linden trees shading the quiet street, on the fluttering banners and pennants everywhere. The air is full of dim sound, wild drift of far-off bell music, the deep hum and stir of the expectant people, the voice of the wind, sweet and low, 
in the green lime labyrinth overhead every glance is turned up the street where the church of st francis of assisi lifts its bluff sandstone tower against the blue the great west door stands open straining the eye the nearest watchers can just make out a glint of altar lights through the cavernous dark within the rich uncertain glow of candles given back from a thousand gleaming points of silver chalice and golden cross and glittering filigree and now the last rumbling harmony of the organ dies away for a moment a deeper silence than ever fills the gothic gloom then the thin fine note of a clarinet lifts up its trembling signal in the darkness the brazen trombones join in with their passionate deep-voiced music the lights begin to move and dance growing nearer and stronger they are coming to the remotest end of the waiting line the whisper spreads slowly the procession winds its way through the great church door and down the precipitous street first the gilded jewel-encumbered cross borne aloft by a young priest in a black cassock and snowy deep-laced surplice then the singing multitude of schoolgirls all in white with wreath-crowned veils like so many lilliputian brides now the boys from the convent seminary in crimson shoulder sashes with their fussing marshals and the elder women after in their doleful decorous black banners swaying rainbow streamers flying the shrill child voices blent with the sound of the wind in the glad green leaves overhead now the trumpets and clarinets have turned the bend of the street the singing gives way to deeper music more banners come flinging and flaunting into the sunny vista the gay procession takes on a darker tinge sisters in black sisters in brown sisters in grey weary faces sad faces comely faces winter and glowing spring and ripe calm autumn all in the same cold livery of sorrow all with the like abandonment to destiny so plainly fettering the innate unrule of will the musicians pass on the deep blurring melody fades the pageant changes monks and friars now an old capuchin father totters by in his rough brown frock carrying a candle on a brazen stick after him a score of his own degree all bearing lights that glimmer and blink superfluously in the sunshine and all chanting a long slow antiphon in a minor key old men reeking of the cloister bent nearly double with their weight of years sturdy young friars ruddy jowled tonsured with only half an eye to their book suave-faced grey-headed superiors eyes in the sky calm transfigured the vanquished world behind every man's broad back and now a weird dirge-like note creeps down the sun-bathed street and a murmur follows it through the craning nudging crowd the end the crown of the pageant is suddenly in view it is all shining celestial white now as the choristers sweep slowly by in their spotless lawn and lace chanting their pseudo requiem as they move behind them a bevy of major priests of comfortable figure gorgeously caparisoned little scarlet robed acolytes walking backwards and strewing the way with rich hued flowers swinging censers vouchsafing their hallow of dim smoke upon the common air and then at last under the great square baldacchino the old roman bishop himself holding aloft the precious monstrance like a glittering captive star a vision now of billowing white and gold and the low sad chant swelling falling and the languorous fragrance of the incense and the trampled flowers wrapped to the eyes in his heavy gilt encrusted cope the old priest grasps his cherished burden with all the little might of his trembling blue-veined hands his eyes are on the gold-rayed treasure casket held but an inch or two beyond his flushed illuminated face 
A trance-like stupor seems to be upon him as he moves, guided on either side by those other two, almost as splendidly robed as himself, who keep a grip on the fringe of his silken coat, and lead him onward in his passionate ecstasy, treading thin air, enwrapped, magnificent with otherworldly light. It is over now. The great canopy has moved on, its bearers keeping ceremonious step and step. More richly accoutred priests follow in a holy rearguard. Then the crowd closes up eagerly behind and surges after them, bareheaded, jostling together, catching now and again a phrase of the mournful melody, and giving it an echo that sobs away into silence, far in the sunny length of the street. As I stand apart, here in the deep shadow of the convent wall, the thronging multitude sweeps by, growing thinner with every moment. The gleaming star of the monstrance sends back a last clear flash of sunlight as it turns the distant foot of the hill. Soon the straggling human fringe of the procession vanishes after it. A debris of blossom litters the long deserted way. Flags and streamers wave their bright hues over the dusty solitude. The street is forsaken, quiet again, save for the bells in the upper air and the wind in the trees. End of section 11 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.